Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, special guest host, Julius DeKempener. Julius has a guest interview for you. Also, he'll be recapping the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Surprise, surprise. Here we are again. It's been a while that I've been hosting The Final Bar for you. But uh, gladly enough, Dave Keller... Uh, had another trip coming, so we can have a little bit of fun here, and that's exactly what we're planning to do. Um, my name is Julius de Campenaar. If you didn't catch that yet, I'm presenting to you from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have my good friend, friend Todd Gordon uh, as my guest later on in the show. And um, I chatted with him before, beforehand, and we're going to rock this thing. Um, we need to go and start with the market recap, as you know. But before that, we have a poll that we needed to deal with. And um, you, all of you, or the ones of you who have uh, voted on the poll, which is in the community tab on our YouTube channel, had the, the choice of four sectors. We listed four sectors there, technology, communication services, uh, consumer discretionary, and industrials. And we asked you which of those sectors was going to be the best performing sector in the next three months. And if we look at the results, then um, technology and industrials are leading the board. So we need to look at those. And then apparently um, all of you or, or those of you who voted uh, are thinking that communication services have, have had their run for now. And to a lesser degree, consumer discretionary. It's a bit of a surprise to me, I've got to say. I'm not surprised about technology and industrials. And I've actually uh, uh, put four of, all four of those charts up in our ACP platform uh, because I think that's a great tool to, these, to do these type of charts. And here are the four sectors that you had to vote on. And let's take a look at the technology. And I can blow them up here. That's what I like so much about ACP. I can play around with this. And what you can see is that technology is actually breaking to new highs. So I can totally get why the group or the community as a whole is actually looking uh, for technology to move a lot higher in the next three months. I, I cannot do anything else than just agree with that. The other one that we're bullish on is industrials and uh, again, I can agree with that, too, because that is now breaking to new all-time highs. As a matter of fact, in my own show, Sector Spotlight, I talked about an uh, industrial sector two weeks ago when I did my monthly charts, because this was one of the two sectors that was actually pushing to new monthly closing highs uh, back in June. Uh, so that was a very good thing. And now, what did you not like? That is uh, communication services, um, which is... I don't know. I, I I think if you if you look in if you look in terms of um, upside potential, then communication services definitely has a long way to go. I'm actually looking at this massive head and shoulder inverted, inverted head and shoulders pattern has worked out here below that uh, sixty level. Um, so whether that's going to be uh, in line with tech or industrials, I don't know. But there's still plenty of upside potential there. Uh, as you say, it's the, the the least favorite one. And if we would put them on an RRG, you're absolutely right. This this tail is coming downwards. So it's losing relative momentum. And then let's do the other one as well. That's uh, consumer discretionary. We'll be talking consumer discretionary later on in the show for sure. But here's the quick chart. And, and that's also uh, looking pretty good. So those four sectors that were the best in the first three months of the first six months of the year, um, are now looking to be uh, very good in the coming three months. And all of you are thinking that tech and industrials will be leading the show. We need to go do a um, market recap. And I actually have a overview with daily charts that I like to use for this purpose. And it gives us, it's a little bit like the dashboard on the homepage of stock charts, uh, but just kind of recreate it inside the uh, advanced charting platform. And what we see here, so these thumbnails, small ones, if we, do, if we do a really quick overview here, you can see that pretty much all these stock market indexes are doing quite well. They're moving from the bottom left of the screen to the top right, which is usually 
a pretty good thing. Um, what I'm actually looking for as in a positive thing is that we see smaller mid-cap stocks picking up. Uh, we'll talk about that later too. You see that the VIX has come down again. And you can see that the bond section, which is, which is at the bottom right here, have started to pick up. And if we just blow them up one by one, then I think that the, uh, the S&P chart is actually, uh, I mean, it's, it's up my alley. I, I think that we're in a pretty strong market, but um, I'm only human. And I got a little bit scared when I heard a lot of people recently talk about um, more negative things. And I was looking at my charts. I was like, I can't really see that. And, you know, you know that feeling when you're, when your idea is going against the, like the majority of the market, or at least a lot of the stories that are out there, you start to doubt yourself and you start to second guess. And am I really right? What am I missing here? Um, so I'm glad I stuck to my guns and we're now actually taking out that 4450 level and pushing to 4,500. I was talking to a journalist earlier today, and he was mentioning that 4,500 level as if it was the next big thing. And I showed him a chart and I said, listen, this 4,500 is a, is a little flimmer of a high back in April. I think the next real level is around 4,600. That's where you have this massive peak here. There's two more here. And the real number that we're looking for is 4,800. That's when the things really start to heat up. So for the S&P 500, 4,500, yes, it is a level, but it's, in my view, not massive. I'm looking for 4,450 on the downside being a support level that can catch any decline if it comes. And the real next resistance level will be somewhere around 46, 4625 probably. But again, 4,800 is way more important than what we're seeing right here. Um, if you look at the Dow, that's actually lagging a bit. It hasn't managed to actually push further up. You can see how that is much lower than the S&P 500 in a relative basis. It is forming, a, I could argue that this is sort of a, looks like a head and shoulders continuation. Um, so we need to take out, let's say 3,500, 3,700 3, in the Dow to actually unlock a lot of new upside potential, but it's definitely not a bad chart. How could it be? Um, another good one is for the NASDAQ, NASDAQ Composite breaking out to new highs here. This also has quite a bit of uh, room to move to the upside. Next area, probably 14,600, uh, and then obviously the 16,200 on the upside right there. Um, NYSE Composite, that's the really broad market. Again, also breaking out to the upside, but a lot lower below the all-time highs than the S&P. So all in all, these charts, all these stock market charts, not surprisingly, are looking the same because it's all stocks. It's just different universes. What I'm really liking right now, because we all know that there's been this narrative, this story for a couple of months that, hey, this rally has been very or is very fragile because it's only carried by a handful of stocks. Um, and to a degree, that was true until not too long ago, like the mega cap stocks were driving the market higher. But since the last couple of weeks, that, that picture has changed, that image has changed. Small cap stocks, mid cap stocks are picking up right now and they're starting to move higher. Um, and here is the uh, S&P 600. And you can see how that gap really left that consolidation phase here. And um, we're, we're absolutely on the way higher right now. So the area to watch here is about 1300, 1320 for the small caps. Uh, and we've got the mid caps here, which are also breaking out with nice gaps. So um, that story about the market being um, narrow based and only driven by a handful of stocks, I'm not buying that anymore. This is actually changing. The market is now much broader. The participation is much broader, and that gives us a lot of extra fuel because these mid and small cap stocks have a lot to catch up with the move that's been made in the large cap stocks. So the way I see it is that those mega large cap stocks, they have let the dance higher. They've pushed the market higher, and now mid and small cap sections are starting to catch up with the, uh, with the mega cap stocks. And that's a way more, a way broader universe. And that's giving the current market uh, a really solid footing to move higher. Quick look in Canada, um, not my neighbors, but probably your neighbors. Uh, nice breakout here to the previous highs. 
Uh, we are looking for a move towards, that is 2100 uh, on the TSX composite. Um, so again, looks very much in line with what's happening in the US. Volatility moving lower again, it remains super low, uh, super stable. That is not indicating any fear whatsoever. And if we look at the, um, the bond markets here, then I, I was very glad, uh, and I'm sure that Todd will mention this as well, um, but I'm glad that we are seeing long, especially the longer end of the curve to actually push a little bit higher because that's giving the stock market a little bit of uh, more fuel. It pushes yields lower. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on the stocks as a whole, but the one thing that could ruin all this bullish outlook is when the bond market and especially the longer end of the curve will come start crashing down and push yields really higher. Um, but the fact that we're now starting to move up again with really nice gaps, uh, I believe is a good sign. Now, finishing up here, the one chart that had um, me as a European, uh, I really don't like. Um, from a stock market perspective, it's probably a good thing, but the, the US dollar is actually coming, uh, crashing down. And that means that the euro, my euro, is getting stronger and that euro dollar is actually moving a lot higher. Uh, so that is, uh, that is a thing that's good for you guys not as good for me. I want one more thing that I want to share with you because not too long ago uh, here at stockcharts.com, we introduced uh, intraday Forex data. And you can now bring up a chart that I'm having right here, uh, which shows you 30 minute charts of a number of major currencies. And if you look here, uh, the Euro dollar, that, that is a, a, today is a great move for Euro dollar moving higher. You see cable, British pound versus US dollar moving higher. And here, dollar yen is a flip side actually moving lower. So all of this is uh, pointing to dollar weakness, and it seems to be working out pretty well for the stock market. I don't like it too much because everything in the US is getting way more expensive now for me. Uh, but hey, that's life. One more chart that I want to share with you, uh, and that's following up with the story that I told you about narrow-based markets. And uh, again, this is another discussion I had with a journalist earlier today. And she asked me, what is the most important chart that you want to share with us today? And I gave her this chart. This is a chart of uh, the red line is the number of stocks that are trading above their 50-day moving average. It's a percentage. So it's a percentage of stocks, in this case, inside the S&P 500 that are trading above their 50-day moving average. And the other one is the S&P that's right behind it. Right now, that percentage is over 80%. 83% of the stocks in the S&P 500 are trading above their 50-day moving average. That's a lot of stocks. That is not a narrow-based market. It was narrow-based here back in March. It was 16%. That was right. That's when, that, when these large-cap stocks, that handful of stocks, was driving the market higher because you can see how the S&P moved higher. That's with 16% of participation. Right now, we got over 80% of participation. I think that's a good thing. I think this market is being carried by a lot more power than we have seen in the last few months. We're going to wrap up the, uh, the, market, um, the market recap right here. And I need to have a few announcements for you, actually. I'd like to encourage you to send in your questions to the final bar mailbag so we can actually answer them online. The final bar email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. Uh, and you can tweet us at, at finalbarsctv, or you can just put a comment below the video here on YouTube. Uh, and secondly, uh, and that is a financial thing, it's very important, so pay attention right now. I'd like to let you know that we have a summer promotion going on here at stockcharts.com. So if you are not a member yet, and if you have ever considered becoming a Stock Charts Premium member, you would be. this would be a really good time to do that. We're running a flash summer special in the month of July, and you'll get 30% off your paid subscription. If you're a current member, you can get this 30% off as well, and just extend your current subscription at the promotional rate. Go to stockcharts.com slash special for more information. Uh, and the good news is that when you're a paid subscriber, you get all the goodies that RRG has to offer you and you don't get only the fixed one that is available for free members. 
Right now, I'd like to introduce my guest, Todd Gordon. Hey, Todd, how are you doing? Oh, he's he's there. I yeah. I need I need to introduce you first. You're you're the founder of TradingAnalysis.com. You're a CNBC contributor, so people may have seen his face on CNBC talking markets. Uh, and I've got to know Todd, I think a couple of pre-pandemic actually at a conference in New York at the CMTA. And we yeah. hung out and we had a really good time. I, I stayed in touch with him and I really value and ap appreciate what you're doing there at tradinganalysis.com. Um, so I'm so happy to have you on the show, Todd. Thank you, Julius. It's uh, great working with you and it's great to be on the show. I've been really impressed watching what Stock Charts has done, the production level and the quality of information you guys are bringing to our community is awesome. So really happy to be here. It's my pleasure. So um, I know that we we spoke before the show and normally, um, so for you viewers, the, the rule for guests on the final bar is that they can send in two charts before the show and then they got like 10 minutes to talk about it. Um, Dave's not here. <laughs> and we took some management decisions that we kind of are going to throw this whole thing on its head. We're so Todd has a, uh, a ton of charts that he wanted to share with us. It's we'll have to see how many we can deal with. Last appearance on, on the final bar. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so um, what shall I start with? That um, that yield curve chart that we talked about. Yeah, let's let's get the heavy macro stuff out of the way. You know, it's I, I think it's it, you said it earlier. It's such a yield driven market. You know, I, I, as a stock trader, which I primarily am, you are. You know, we have a research business. I just launched a money management business. We're focusing on individual equities, but yet we've all become fixed income yield curve experts and Fed policy experts. I think it's so important. So how do you not start off with the, the massive inversion that we're seeing in the yield curve? And a lot of people, rightfully so, are very concerned. So I figure let's let's kind of bat this one around to start. Yeah. So no, yeah, just, it's it's it's, it's I, your I, part. So you you explain okay. to me what all these circles are meaning and what you want to tell us with that. Okay, so so real quick, you know, you know, everyone's looking back at the last two inversions, and those are the two red circles that you're hovering right there. So that's the 2000 tech crash in 2008. Obvious yield curve inversion, and specifically what we're, we're looking at here is the 10-year yield subtracted from the three-month, which the three-month really has a better correlation to where Fed sets short-term policy, right? So everyone's saying we have massive inversion, so we must be heading into a recession. And you'll say, okay, well, maybe, but you know, consider the source just looking at these two periods of inversion. Why did short-term rates go above long-term rates, which creates that yield curve inversion? Because the Fed had to jack up rates to cool off, you know, overheated tech bubble and then a housing bubble. So demand was driving that yield push on the short term to slow the economy. Now it's not really the case. It wasn't a demand issue that caused it, it was the supply from the pandemic. So that's the first thing that's different. But the second thing is look at the last two. Look at those other two that I highlighted in green, those cases of yield curve inversion, right? Those are those are those in the 80s, right? 80s and um, I think it was seven. What, what, what is that? That's, this is, this uh, 82. is 82. Yep. And this one is 89. That should, be, that should be the beginning of the first Gulf War coming out of that area. So, but those two periods of yield curve inversion created great buying opportunities in the stock market. S&P's there in purple. So we had two yield curve inversions that were big sells because of a demand-driven issue. And then prior to that, you had inversion uh, that created great stock market opportunities. And again, I, I'm in like eternally grateful for what John Murphy's done. And one of the biggest takeaways I, I got from his profit from global intermarket analysis was, you know, post-98 is when we went from an inflationary economy to deflationary economy with Asian currency crisis, long-term capital management, a lot of things changed. So the macro relationship changed. That, that right there was a result of a disinflationary, deflationary economy. Maybe we're back in an inflationary economy where, where things are changing. So I'm just going to put that one ahead. So that's what I'm saying. Is that a green circle or is it a red circle? So when will we know? Yet, I don't know, man. We trade the now. We don't trade. We don't trade based on our future projection projections. Yeah. <laughs> so let let's move on to to the next one. Okay. Um, so that's the uh, this is a very long term chart of yep. the S and P and the thirty year bonds. 
Yeah. So this is this is making the same point. So I love this chart. I, I've shown this in multiple presentations. Like this is the chart. It's ever since I was born, stocks and bonds have been trading together, right? And and there's a 20 period uh, correlation uh, just below that. The only two periods uh, in the last 44 years, that's holy cow, um, that we've seen clear negative correlation is in those two big market sell-offs, right? The tech bubble and, and GFC. And what happened there? As I labeled right there, we had stocks down, bonds up in 2000 with a negative correlation. In 2008, we had stocks down, bonds up. Now what's happening? We just flipped the script. We're in 2020 pandemic. What happens is we had bonds down and net net stocks went up. So we just, we have a different kind of change right now. So I'm wondering, you and I were, had a really good discussion, you know, before the show, like, okay, do we need long-term yields to drop to continue this rotation into growth? Or is there some kind of change in, in global macroeconomics that we might not be accounting for? Again, first time in two decades that we saw a negative correlation, but stocks went up and bonds went down. Maybe that 40 year run and bonds could be over. I mean, there's a lot, it's a much deeper discussion, but I don't know what's going to happen. But it's important that we sit down every day as stock traders, investors, and say, what's happening in the macro relationships? What could happen in the future? And I just don't want to be surprised if something comes out of the blue like this. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and as I just said in my intro, also, is that uh, I mean, the relationship between stocks and bonds right now is, is clearly in favor of stocks. There's no doubt about it. But I'm keeping in the back of my mind the, the, the plan B, the alternative, the what if, what if, what, what can go wrong to undermine that bullish outlook for stocks? And I think that is in the bond market. If the longer end of the bond market is going to drop and push yields higher, that's probably when stocks will get into trouble. So, hey, um, I think that we're, we're like on the, on the same page with this one. Stocks in favor of, of bonds right now. Um, and we just need to keep bonds uh, in our sights. Yes. And we really don't want them to start going down hard. As long as they stay at the same level, that's probably good. And it's probably still good for stocks as long when, when bonds are really going to deteriorate and fall and push yields higher. That's when we need to start revisiting that bullish scenario for the stock market. And, and maybe, the, I think maybe the best case is if we can get a little bit more selling on the long end and we can sort of bring the longer end rates up and we can sort of normalize the yield curve a little bit. And maybe rates stay this way for a couple of years and that'd be fine too. Yep, I, I, I totally agree with that. And, and getting the yield curve back into a slightly more normal, um, slightly more normal level that that would be helpful, I think. Right, uh, right. Because this is something that a lot of people are looking at. And I don't, I don't want to keep going down this path, but like, because I, I was so excited to talk to you guys, because this is this is the the Disney World of of technicals. Um, but then we got to talk about real rates, and we got to look at inflation expectations. There's a massive divergence happening. You got to look at nominal yield curves versus real yield curves. I mean, I, I'm a technician. Let's stay there. But there's, it's a much deeper discussion. Yeah. Let's move on to uh, yields and the U.S. dollar. It just showed the move of the U.S. dollar. It scares the hell out of me as a European, I can tell you. I was, I was still very, very happy with euro dollar going down. And all of a sudden, it's above 112. It just like two days, it went from below 110 to over 112. That's a, that's a huge move in euro dollar. I, it is. It is. I mean, it, I was looking forward to skiing in uh, in Europe this this winter, but yeah. uh, pull on know, over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, it's it, traditionally the dollar has an inverse relationship with global equities. Um, I think the dollar breaking down is is a good thing. You know, the correlation between the ten year yield, especially as that inflation scare came on post pandemic, clearly the correlation between yields and the dollar was there. Uh, U.S. interest rate differentials go up. That creates an FX trade. Overseas flows come into the U.S. Even if the U.S. like for example, in the housing crisis, even though we started the housing crisis, money flew into the S to the U.S. for short-term liquidity. Um, you know, now you know the dollar's selling off. I think we just broke a good up uh, trend. You know, sort of a, a lower support level here. 
is it going to pull the 10 year yield down? You know, we were bumping up against four, we went like 408 in the 10 year yield. It was a July thin move before all this big data came out in, in earnings report. So, you know, we have a lot of things tugging on that 10 year yield to, to get back below. And look how fast that thing came off when it went like 405 bid. It's like, it closed like three three point eight five or whatever today. So there's a lot of forces working on that ten year yield moving lower, and that lower dollar I think is I think that's going to be very good for equities. Yeah, and it's actually it's good it could actually fit what we've just been talking about in yields that this this lower dollar I could see when I just look at the chart of the yields here I can see it's a little bit of a trading range and I could see that going down to like three three. Right, um, you know, it's still in the range, but you know, with that lower dollar, that could definitely drive uh, ten-year yields back to down to the lower threes. So, uh, yep. so that'll be helpful as well. But, but again, that's going to further invert the yield curve. So here we go. It like, is, this, yeah, true that, true that. Yeah. And I don't think um, anyone knows the answer. I think we have to be aware of a couple scenarios as investors. You cost, you don't. It's not your job to know what's going to happen in the future. You're managing money. You're running money. You have to know, you know, you have scenario A and scenario B. You, you should never really be surprised in the market. And it's not hedging. It's not not taking a position. It's just, you know, the different pitfalls that are ahead of you. Yeah, I come from a military background and we always created scenarios and there was always plan A, B, C, D. And we knew that, yeah. you know, as soon as boots are on the ground, plan, plan A is out of the door. Yeah, something happens, plan A is out of the door, but you just have to know what plan B and C is. So whenever yep. you're confronted with a different scenario, you already have done your homework and you know what you need to do to, to actually catch that bullet. And that's a big difference between being an analyst and being a trader. And, and a, you know, you an analyst has to go on TV. When I go on TV, put my hat on, you got to have it a short opinion and that's it. But as a trader, you're running money, you're like, yeah, it could be this, could be that. If A happens, to do B. If C happens, we'll do D. You know, that, that's the way you have to look at it. I think, you know, that's the beauty of technicals and what we're doing here is you can lay out those scenarios. We're going to adjust it. We're going to talk uh, stocks and, and more precisely value growth stuff dear to my heart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know you. I knew you'd love this one. Um, so, you know, it relates really well with that last chart, you know, so so normally, you know, as the dollar sells off. U.S. companies, specifically our large caps, you know, they obviously have a lot of overseas exposure, so weaker dollars going to help their earnings. Right now, it's the other thing that's driving the whole rotation, which is this chart. It's more interest rates. Interest rates are driving the whole valuation question. The higher the rates, the harder it is to convince investors to hold high valuation companies with the hopes of profits down the line. So as rates are moving up in blue, they're, you know, post-pandemic, the value growth ratio was following right behind. So value was outperforming growth. There was a major rotation into value, rightfully so, as rates were spiking and volatility was up. Well, same thing. So the last chart has the dollar pulling lower against those 10-year yields. Now we have value growth pulling lower against those 10-year yields. Everyone is trying to convince those yields to come down. And I think Jay Powell and crew is, is, is standing right in the way. So, you know, we have this, this Vanguard uh, value growth uh, ratio, which can't get up off the floor. I think it's trading about 0.50. I'm waiting for it to drop. Um, and we have a clear outperformance of value uh, of growth versus value. Again, this is value growth. So value moving down means growth is outperforming. Um, it, it's a clear, clear, you know, clear divergence between those two. I mean, is the correlation between yields and valuation going to break down? Or is this a case potentially of the tail wagging the dog where stocks can kind of move the fixed income market? You know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see, uh, but it, it certainly appears that way as we're heading into to Q2 earnings and earnings seem to be pretty solid here. So I, I ultimately think the 10 the year yield will catch down, as you said, go hit the bottom of that range. Yeah. Uh, and the ROG that you sent me is, is sending that message very, very clearly. So uh, for those of you watching, this is a monthly RRG. I don't, I don't really use that all too often, but thought just asked me to put this monthly uh, uh, chart on for the uh, Vanguard mega cap growth uh, and Vanguard mega cap value uh, indices. And, and this message couldn't be more clear uh, in favor of growth. Um, it, it's it, it, the monthly for me is so, is so telling. Can you make those tails longer? How long can those tails go? They go 30, 30 months actually. Okay. So, I went back and I looked at since the the birth of all the growth ETFs, and I, I don't know if I sent you the study, Julius, but 
you know, if you look at the blue, which is mega cap growth, everyone's saying that the value, the growth trade is way overdone. We're being led only by the magnificent seven and growth is way overdone. Looking at RRG, which is an amazing tool. Thank you, Julius, for giving us this. Like, seriously, it's for me, it's kind of changed the way I've approached, you know, trading and asset management. Um, growth hasn't even rotated in yet. We're in the improving. We're not even in leading. And I went back and looked at all the growth history I could find. I found that when you get a true rotation from improving into leading on the monthly for growth, it tends to last over two and a half years. Right. And the, so, so the, the growth and also growth will stay in favor longer than value will stay in favor, which makes sense because growth has outperformed value since, I don't know, since then, I think the nineties, maybe. Um, but it stays in favor for a long time. So if this is truly a rotation into growth, like, dude, we're not even, we're just getting started. We're and just I'm getting not, started. And I'm yeah. not a perma bull. Like I, I could be, I could go to cash and short the market tomorrow. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I think, I think there's a lot of offsides investors. We got to figure out what's going on in the fed, but if this thing rotates in on a monthly leading, we're just getting started. Yep. Yeah. Um, there was a little bird beeping in my ears a minute ago and uh, telling me that I need to wrap it. We're going to oh. be a little bit naughty here, so we're gonna we're gonna ditch those Sorry. two RGs because they're they're telling the same story just in a different way. We're yep. going to move on to the consumer discretionary sector. So yep. here's consumer discretionary on the RRG on a monthly RRG. Um, tell me what you think. Yeah. Um, so growth trades coming in as we just we just belabored it. The last point, the chart that you had to skip over, I get it. I know I get too long winded. Um, smalls and medium cap growth are rotating in as well, is as well as small and medium cap val. So value, everything's coming in. Consumer discretionary within the growth trade has kind of been the holdout uh, next to comms and tech. Consumer discretionary is finally going in. So you have on your this is the monthly RRG. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so monthly RRG XLY just left lagging is going into improving. So, you know, we again, this is a, a cash strapped economy with a, a consumer who's squeezed from inflation. And yet, you know, you watch the housing stocks, what, eight months ago, you watch the casino and hotel stocks all of a sudden start to rotate in. And I'm saying, wait a minute, this is, and I, I saw this in RRG, Julius. So I was like, wait, we're going into a cash draft recession. The, the the consumer's in trouble yet. Discretionary is rotating in. Tech was already going, but consumer discretionary is coming in. Really interesting. And there's a lot of you know consumer discretionary goes across multiple parts of the economy. And again, it just underlines the point that if you know if if you know maybe the consumer is stronger than we thought. Yeah. So here here's the weekly, and you can see how that is a little bit more granular. How also yeah. on the weekly. Consumer discretionary is really powering into the leading quarter. So really in a relative uptrend versus the S&P 5. Doing better than tech and comms. All of a sudden the weekly XLY Absolutely. is like 45 yeah. degree angle top right. Like XLY is great. So look here at the chart of XLY, Dan. Uh, that's a lot. By the way, this is the, lot, the last chart that we're going to talk about. Okay. And then we're going to do the three and three. And uh, unlike Dave, who just likes to do it all himself, Todd and I will do the three and three together. You're going to keep so, me around? Just really quickly, tell me about this XLY chart that's breaking out to, what's well, not really new all-time highs, but it's a major level that we're taking out here right now. Just so simple. I think you said it earlier, maybe on the Dow Jones. I think it was DJI. Um, you know, just you, you call it inverse head and shoulders. We're, we're pressing that summer of uh, 22 high. And again, XLY is the catch-up to the growth trade. Tech is going, I mean... XLK is pretty much a new highs. Uh, XLC is is coming back, doing well. Uh, consumer discretionary breaking that high. I mean, you know, we're, we're coming up into 61% retracement in this guy, looking good, where all the other major growth guys are through the 786 retracement, which if you don't hold that, you know, if you don't back away from that, you're going to new highs. So the fact that this guy's getting through, I think you said it, March of 22 is going to be the next step. And we got to figure out which sec which industries and stocks are going to help XLY move higher. Thank you so much. Now, you've not done this before, but we have three minutes to talk <laughs> about three charts. With the way you've been talking, that is going nowhere, but we're going to try. <laughs> All right. So the I... first one, the first chart that we're going to discuss is Tesla. What do you think of this? I, I love the chart of Tesla. The only thing that I'm worried about is the fact that it's coming into this heavy 
resistance yep. zone here. It's a pretty broad one, but tell me what you think. Yeah, yeah. If you if you actually throw a trend line on the semi log scale off the highs, you don't have to, but we're coming right into the to the trend line. I think it's a touch point in twenty one, mid of twenty two. We're right there. And plus, I'm a fib guy. Um, you, know, you do a seven eight six retracement all time high to low. We're there. If you break through, then of course you have those August highs. Uh, you know, again, talk about you know a hated stock down into those corrective lows right where your cursor is. The stocks come ripping back. It's a little hesitant in here because Elon started yet another company. Uh, so we're coming up on earnings. They their their manufacturing numbers and their delivery numbers were blowout. Um, so I'm continuing to be bullish. I don't know how you don't like the stock. We, whatever you think of Elon, I'm seeing more and more Teslas out there. I'm long personally, have it in the wealth management. I have some options on in it. Uh, I think we get up to around 290, 300 after earnings. Good. Second one. Um, that is Draft Kings. Yeah. It's a gambling stock inside consumer discretionary. I love, I love the way that this is breaking out here. Uh, the only thing that concerns me a little bit is, do we need to buy it now or are we going to wait for a fullback? Because we're really chasing the market higher right now if we, we get in right here. So that's the only concern that I have, but it can totally see the strength of this stock. A hundred percent. Yeah, you, you you certainly want to try to buy a break, a breakout um, from that uh, sort of consolidation pattern. It, it goes back to the earlier point. This was an earlier mover with a rotation within casinos, hotels, and gambling within consumer discretionary. Stock's done great. Uh, you know, there's more. Uh, states that are legalizing gambling and, you know, the economy continues to do well um, and, and people are liking to play here. I mean, look at Churchill Downs, another one, uh, a good consumer discretionary stock. I live here in Saratoga Springs. The track just opened for the season. Uh, so it's uh, it's a good stock way for the pullback. Uh, fundamentals are strong. They're, they're The digital digitalization of what they're doing uh, is, is very solid. So I like the company. A little late right now, I agree. Wrap it. Last one, Crocs. Um, love, people love or hate their shoes. They, they you love or hate them. Uh, the, the, exactly. The stock has done great. In fact, the entire shoe industry, sub-industry group within Consumer Scratchers doing well, like Skechers, uh, Crocs, um, the those ONTO shoes, those Swiss shoes, those are great. Look at the whole group. Um, but the company's done well. They kind of restructured themselves. I feel like it was a failed head and shoulders pattern right there. You know, you started with a left shoulder in February, up to the head, rare it is. And then, you know, we, when you have a failed pattern like that, it's great. Um, the company's showing some really good strength. That's a good Elliott Wave, fourth wave pattern. Uh, I have the stock. I own the stock in my growth portfolio and wealth management. I think we're going to go up and try to attack those 150 highs. I, I totally agree. There's a little bit of a resistance in that gap area probably, but that's still yeah. way up. Um, has all the all the potential to move higher. Um, hey. This was great. We're we're way over time. We're way more than we should. But the good news is we're only on YouTube. So time is not much of a constraint anymore. Uh, I'm just going to thank you first, Todd, for joining me here. I love it. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to ask you back more often in the show, either here or in Sector Spotlight. So thanks very much for today. And I'm looking forward to speaking to you soon, my friend. Guys, it's been my pleasure. Seriously, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, that's it for today. It was my pleasure to host the final bar again for you. It's been a while, but it's always fun. Uh, tomorrow, Dave will be back with you with a pre-recorded show where he deals with a lot of questions in the mailbag. And I, I encourage you to watch that because these questions uh, are coming in and they're usually the people who take the go to the effort to actually write in usually represent a bigger group. So the odds that your questions are getting answered in tomorrow's show are pretty big. Once again, thank you for watching. My name is Julius de Campanar, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again at a new episode of The Final Bar. Don't know when, don't know where, but I'll be there.